So, Todoris Yorgakopoulos, on behalf of the Aneosis, um, he is the um, editorial director of the Aneosis. And Andrea Renda, who is connecting to us from Brussels. Andrea Renda is, uh, oops, sorry. Andrea Renda, I have to read your entire title, Andrea, sorry for that. He is the Senior Research Fellow and Head of Global Governance, Regulation, Innovation and Digital Economy of CEPS, uh, the Center for European uh, Public Studies. So, Policy Studies, sorry. Um, first of all, I would like to invite to, to welcome all of you here, uh, and I'm hoping that the other panelists will be able to join us in a couple of minutes. Uh, I would like to make a very short introduction why we decided to do this. So, um, we would like to um, try to contribute as much as possible to the global discussion that is taking place under the unusual and extreme conditions of the coronavirus pandemic. And um, this comes in the context of the work that we do through the Institute for Sustainable Development at the European Public Law Organization, through which we invite speakers uh, from time to time to have something like a masterclass event in which they explain their point of view in relation to sustainable development. Because of the lockdown, we decided to do that through web seminars, through webinars and um, electronic roundtables. And we reached out also to the analysis to see whether they would be willing to team up with us for a series of four webinars that we'll be doing over this and the next month. And I have to thank on, uh, on the name of Fodoris Yorogopoulos all of the analysis for having been an enthusiastic supporter of our effort and our initiative. Um, so we decided that we'll be doing those four webinars over the span of two months roughly. And then we reached out to the speakers of the first webinar. I'm also happy to say that we had 100% success. So uh, we asked the three speakers and all three speakers accepted. So I think that it will uh, be a very uh, good set. Now, in terms of um, introduction about what we will be discussing, uh, the first round table, we decided to have, or before I speak to you about the first round table actually, um, I think I should say a couple of things about why we think that this is a special occasion for doing what we're doing. Um, the issues, the social and economic and, and human also conditions, but also the effect on the environment that is happening through the lockdown in most of the world are unprecedented. I mean, we have never seen things like this in the world. And we believe that the issues that are emerging also in terms of society, of operation, of governance, of how citizens and governments are operating are, are very uh, different. And we also expect that uh, this change that is radical will be even more radical after this whole thing has ended and hopefully has ended for good, although there are already voices saying that we must be preparing for a resurgence. Um, Especially in terms of the role, the comparative role of governments and citizens, what is happening is that we have seen in these uh, last weeks that governments have taken the biggest part of, of the image, let's say, because they had to step in, take all the measures that they took for confinement, for controlling the spread of the virus, but also trying to control and provide solutions for the grave economic uh, crisis that is following all this slowdown of the economy. What has happened in the middle of that is that citizens have been much more restricted in the way that they could take action. Uh, first, because the confinement is there. Second, because the role of the governments has been unusually loud and, and very central. And so we wanted to look into what is happening during the pandemic, but even more importantly, after the pandemic, because the role of citizens in the sense of citizens unions, of NGOs, of um, commercial and professional unions as well, will be very important for the day after. It is important now for the support of citizens. It will be even more important for the reconstruction of the economy and for healing all the wounds in the social level. So for this, uh, we have set out a number of questions about uh, the balance that needs to be brought between citizens and governments, about how we can safeguard representation of citizens and good governance in the future, and what can be the role of, uh, the, of civil society. And also, uh, one of the questions that we have been uh, considering is whether this can be thought to be like a kickstart, like a forced, if you like, kickstart 
or the fourth industrial revolution and the internet of things because everybody will be working more through in, um, electronic means even after the end of the pandemic so um, while we will be uh, we're still waiting for the two other members of the panel to to join in unfortunately but i would like to check with andrea if she would like to be the first one to take the floor since we can uh, we can start with him uh, before i give the floor to andrea i just want to ask Thodoris on behalf of um, the analysis if he wants to say one or two things uh, in terms of uh, introduction for this well, we're actually very curious to, to discuss and debate the, the answers to the, these questions, possible answers that could be given. Um, these questions are very uh, real, very uh, pressing. And the fact that society is under an enormous stress is not something that we need to look only academically, but it will in fact, it does uh, in fact, um, have severe and uh, impactful consequences in everything that we do in our daily lives and our work as an organization. So we have to look into that uh, from that perspective as well. So I'm really excited and we're very thankful that we have the opportunity to discuss these issues uh, with your guests. And um, uh, I, I will be happy to return with many, many questions for Andrea and the others. Super, uh, Andrea, you have to unmute yourself and we're ready to, yeah, you're ready to go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody that is attending the seminar. Thanks to you and, uh, and, um, and to the Anneosis as well uh, uh, to, for, um, for jointly organizing this seminar series. I think it's a very timely um, series and also you've chosen uh, a number of topics that are not necessarily the ones that are most straightforward. I mean, the ones that are most covered. We, uh, from the Brussels perspective, we are now in a situation in which um, uh, a lot of the debate is concentrating on uh, uh, the recovery or the reopening of the economy. And uh, the European Commission has uh, recently published a, a blueprint or a roadmap for uh, um, sort of reopening the economy in the member states and the attempt to do it in a, a relatively harmonized way across countries. Uh, there's also, of course, a lot of debate on the uh, economic and financial assistance to the member states, the famous Corona bonds, uh, as opposed to the ESM. There's a, there's a debate on, uh, uh, on many things, but there's no real debate on how are we going to co-create for civil society the life in the post lockdown and in the immediate, uh, you know, in the, in the immediate um, days after the lockdown is released, but also what's going to happen in the medium term, since it is uh, quite likely that we are going to um, live with the virus uh, for quite a long time. And, uh, um, and this is so something that is very different from what happens normally in, in, uh, in times of war. And for a war, even if the metaphor um, has been um, uh, uh, evoked in, uh, in several cases and in several writings, when the war is over, uh, typically it's over. When the enemy is gone, it's gone. Here we are just in a situation in which we are trying to postpone to so-called flatten the curve, to, to delay a little bit the contagion and be able, be able to manage that contagion in a better way, in a more effective way with our limited resources in healthcare. Um, but of course, if we restart today uh, as we used to live before, the contagion is going to come back. There's no a way to, to have a vaccine or a therapy that really works as, uh, as we stand. So there is a, um, a, 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 a new set of problems that are different from the ones that we've had before. We have an unprecedented type of economic shock. We are um, feeling the urgency to reorganize our lives, at least for the medium term, in a way that avoids congestion, avoids to, to really resume the daily routine that puts us all in the same place, maybe in the morning, in the afternoon, going to work, coming back to work. And, and this is going to uh, um, build and bring a lot of disruption to the life of citizens uh, on top of the one that already has, has occurred. And uh, it is true that civil society has been passive, uh, meaning it's been not, has not been involved in this story, whereas uh, in most cases what we have in many of our countries, uh, I would add my home country, Italy, but your country, many other countries, you have uh, governments that um, uh, come in uh, on maybe once a day or twice a day, they give their press conferences and they have this impression of a directorate or a Soviet that is giving 
uh, a communication on uh, on what the government has decided that will happen and whether people are going to have to wear masks or people whether people are going to have to stay home and in what circumstances and whether technology is going to be coming to to help us or not and this is something that in my opinion for the greek population is probably even more a, a source of pain and suffering because it might remind you of recent history in which you had these people from the troika coming in and dictating a little bit what you had to do in order, and giving you a model of society that was not necessarily the autochthonous model of society that you have so and that is something that is happening again and it's likely to happen again for most of the countries that are likely to suffer uh, in a disproportionate way from this um, the other thing that is missing in my opinion for, for civil society in this um, in this situation is the communication of science it's the evidence-based policy making and the evidence-based communication uh, there have been attempts to communicate on the side for example of the european center of disease control uh, and scientists academics but i think this voice has been overwhelmed and surpassed by a large extent by um, disinformation fake news social media spreading a lot of fear and uh, there's a lot of confusion for civil society the difficulty of interpreting what's going on so this is exactly the opposite of what in principle could happen thanks to technology the empowerment of civil society the empowerment of people the idea that whatever is to be done is so difficult um, so acrobatic that it really requires social acceptance and um, and it has to be co-created with people it has to be co-created with unions, it has to be co-created with the industry associations, it has to be co-created with civil society organizations and so on and so forth. So you see um, the, 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 the strength of civil society in co-creating solutions when you look at the United States, like a place that is non-unionized, if you wish, and a place in which over two weeks we, we went from 330,000 uh, um, uh, unemployed to more than 10 million unemployed. Uh, just because the, 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 the workforce is so fragile and the, and the, gig, con the gig workers are so much uh, um, precarious that uh, um, it, the moment the crisis starts, the moment the, the situation changes for them and they, they go and apply for unemployment subsidies immediately. So having a strong civil society and a strong involvement of civil society is extremely important. I think we're going to have to find better ways um, than, than the ones we've found so far. It is an irony that uh, civil society as, uh, um, is not being sufficiently involved just as the EU is approaching the original deadline for starting uh, the Future of Europe conference, which was in principle all about a stronger involvement of civil society. And in principle, it should have started in May, but more officially through the German presidency from July onwards, landing on a French presidency in 2022. Well, I think we are facing uh, a very important uh, laboratory uh, for the involvement of civil society and we're not using it. So um, one good example of this as I come, wrap up this first comments is technology, right? Is um, uh, a very good example for me is this debate that is raging uh, across Europe on the so-called contact tracing apps in technology. The fact that, that uh, governments might want to use the, uh, the technology to a trace uh, uh, um, whenever one someone tests positive to trace through the memory of the smartphone all the other people that have been in the same uh, uh, let's say in the proximity of this person that tested positive over the past two two weeks and there's um, an, a, an important debate as to uh, whether uh, this is something that uh, uh, um, uh, could be done by respecting privacy or not. And, uh, and this is something that is taking place with no participation from civil society. Uh, and we have our stronghold, the GDPR, uh, the data protection legislation that is potentially put at risk by uh, um, the establishment of things that are much more similar to mass surveillance. And this is happening through technical uh, uh, documentation and through the setting up of technical task forces. But it's not happening in a way that empowers people and asks them, would you be willing to give up part of your privacy rights in exchange for um, being able to go outside, to move outdoors and, and be, uh, and be uh, resuming uh, life. So all this is a very bad start if we want to really design the future industry 4.0 uh, um, uh, on the basis of the experience that we are having right now. So I don't think, well, I think that this is going to lead to a lot of an acceleration of the role of technology in society. Uh, certainly, we are all moving online many things. 
but I think that we have to take a, a pause and think about how we want to design this different life if we really want to make sure uh, that it brings an improvement rather than a worsening of our living conditions. So I'll stop there and, um, and uh, hand over uh, back to Spiros for, and I see that the other speakers have joined, or at least one of the other speakers have joined. Uh, and, uh, and so happy to get uh, questions, comments, and continue the conversation. Andrea, thank you very much. I think these are all very valid points. Um, there's a little bit of a gloom outlook in what we heard from you because it's true that some of the things are starting on the wrong foot, but I think um, it's a very good time in, at which uh, Christos Elefantis, who is the um, editor-in-chief of Schedia magazine, and he's the inspirer, actually, of the Schedia magazine, which for those who do not know Schedia, I think everybody in Greece knows it, but for some people who are not Greek and following our, our webinar, uh, this is the initiative that provides livelihoods through actual empowerment of people that do not have shelter, that do not have a job, and so on. And so um, it has been one of the NGOs that has been very active and actually provided a lot of support to people that were in the direst need, I think, in conditions of lockdown and everything. So I would like to turn now to Christos after I welcome him to our webinar. Christos, thank you very much and sorry for all the difficulty you had to, to look up. This is the struggles we're all facing now with the social distancing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's easier I've to be close a, to people. I've had quite stressful last 15 minutes, you know, trying to join yeah. the conversation. Yeah, but you I did it. So. I made would it. you like to share with us a little bit of your experience and your thinking behind how a civil society organization, an NGO like the one that you have created and are leading, can play such an important role in a time of such a, a yeah, great see, challenge? I, I'm really sorry I missed the Andreas's uh, uh, presentation or saying his, uh, his uh, point of view, but he did mention, among other things, the word empowerment. So actually, what we see now from our perspective and our experience is that for some people, what we, we are all collectively experiencing is self-isolation, but for, for many, many people in this part of the world, and I'm sure around the world, it is a new form of the extreme social exclusion, okay? For, because for all of us, or for many of us, it's okay, you know, being self-isolated at home, you know, with our Netflix, I became a subscriber lately, and, uh, you know, our Twitter accounts and, you know, our TV sets, but for, for severe vendors, you know, super vendors in Greece and around the world, this is, this is really, this is really, especially in Greece, bringing back memories of, of the very recent past where they were really socially excluded. So when we had to suspend our operations, people were really, really becoming desperate. You know, because as, as it was just about uh, starting to feel, you know, part of society again, you know, being, feeling visible. And, you know, I'm, I'm selling Sevilla street paper. I'm in a theater group. I'm, 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 I'm having, I'm becoming visible again. They, they've been asked to withdraw, okay? To, to uh, whether this is in a shelter or whether it's in a, in a small apartment, uh, in central Athens, with or without electricity, uh, the effect is the same. So what we do try to do, other than provide uh, the absolutely absolute necessities like food and medicine, is try to to make people feel feel you know experience this period as less painfully as possible. Yeah. Okay. So whether this is by providing a knitting set or creating uh, audio books, you know, but this is one of the things that we do is we've, we got free children's books from a publishing house and we've asked our vendors, homeless people, uh, to do the voiceover and to create these audio books so that, so that they keep feeling some kind of attachment to the rest of the world and keep feeling, you know, being part of it, which is very, to feel visible. So uh, I think from our perspective and what we experience is that homeless people in Greece, definitely severe vendors are uh, horrified feeling that this is the end of them, you know, for them. You know. Again, you know that Shedea is going to close down. Many, many social services have either scaled down or suspended their operation. So we do have over the last few weeks, 
people knocking on our, on our doors you know, who are not severe vendors uh, asking for assistance. So, so the way we, we try to do things, okay, as far as the organization is concerned, of course, we try to keep a pace with development. Like I had a Skype call this morning with my colleagues uh, from Scotland and Norway, and we were talking about cashless payments already. You know, how Sedia vendors can still be out there in the era of social distancing and still keep selling magazines. Okay, so, uh, uh, cashless payments is one way to do this, uh, probably. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to, to, to the very own well-being and being uh, as happy as they can be where they are uh, right now, as I said, we try to provide with them the means that, so that they can feel useful and connected to society at the same time. Um, uh, this is it as an introduction. I'm not sure. Uh, definitely, definitely, we are concerned uh, in this part of the world, as uh, you all very well know. Uh, after seemingly coming out of a very, very huge uh, socioeconomic crisis, uh, now the same, the same people who were the first victims of the crisis seem to be the first to suffer again. And Christo, is, thank you. Hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for, for uh, putting down your experience with us. I think that the work that you have been doing is very important because exactly in times of, for those people that are in, in total desolation practically, it is important to know that there is a system that can provide something. And what we have seen, and I was discussing that on the phone with Andrea the other day, is that for the people that you are trying to help are people that are not registered in any system of support. So the state does not have a way to supporting them in any way because it, it just doesn't even know them. I mean, there is, it's very difficult. So this is where the, the role of civil society, the work that you do, for example, is so important. And I'm very happy to welcome Mario Pezzini. Mario, I'm so sorry you had all this difficulty connecting. No, 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 don't, don't worry. The next one will be much easier, I can promise that. Um, <laughs> But in my discussion with Mario a few days ago when we were discussing about this webinar, he was referring to some examples that I'm, I think he will be sharing with us from countries where um, there are already very um, visible problems in terms of parts of society that are left out, that are marginalized, that are uh, suspended, as, as Christo said. And I think that in the minutes that will follow after the presentation by Mario, uh, it would be important to try to come together, to put your minds together with the help also of Thodoris Yorokopoulos to see how we can help move to a direction after the uh, pandemic that will actually provide more support systems also through civil society. So Mario, would you like to take the floor for a few minutes? Thank you very much, Piros. It's a pleasure to be all together and I am very sorry that it took a long time. We are not so acquainted with the COVID. In any case, let me start by saying that the COVID, under my point of view, has pressed the reset button for many governments in developing countries. In reality, the situation in developing countries was coming to a very serious a conflict in many areas of the developing countries. I'm thinking, obviously, to Latin America. Everybody has followed the example of Chile, of Ecuador, of Peru but also in Africa, the tension that we underestimate that are ongoing on the Sahel and are serious tension concerning uh, starvation, in reality, of more 70 million than those that were already starving, on the tension that exists in Asia. What are those tensions about? And well, it was pretty clear that there were a series of traps for further development. These countries experimented from 2000 to 2010 an incredible growth that did not necessarily translate it in development. Uh, 83 countries had a rate of growth more than the double of the average in the OECD, and we know very well a series of names, China and many other, among other Chile, but the number was extremely big. Now, despite this coming growth, 
uh, development didn't reach everybody. Inequality were extremely high. There was a kind of middle class, but the middle class that was vulnerable. And therefore, in one end, saw a possibility to change their condition, but on the other, remained vulnerable and therefore frustrated. The result is that a series of very strong trap, I mean, cumulative mechanisms that, if not addressed with public policy, will continue to increase, appear. Among other one, I would like to stress in this debate, there was an institu institutional trap. You had people asking more from the state. In certain cases, the state tried to answer, but not enough. And therefore, people unsatisfied start going towards the private sector or in the street. The answer was in many cases a kind of delegitimation of the state to receive taxes. And therefore even less capacity of the state to intervene. Then you enter in a loop. And now if this was a, the situation, I think we were confronted with a crisis of the social contract. And if you think to Chile, that maybe is the best metaphor, the government was obliged to rebuild a social contract. But how do you do it? We are no more in a in historical period like the one of my grandfather that didn't go to school. People as the tool, as the instrument to discuss and to debate, and they want a voice. That's the common treat that we find in all the geographical diseases, but I mean in this respect, not only developing country, also ECD country. The Gilets Jaunes were always saying, you don't know how I live which means give me voice, I want to participate and to speak. What is the tool therefore to be used now and when we will be over from the COVID crisis, when we will be confronted with rebuilding an even more poor social contract? Well, I think we need a large involvement of different actors to discuss all the time which is required to build a vision and then a strategy. Very often, we will have to use plans, but these plans are no more the one designed by technological elite and the rest transmitted to people. There cannot be a plan if this is not a process of different deliberation with experimental democracy involving all the actors. So I finish by saying, this is the case of developing country, but there was an economist that some many decades ago, they used to say, the te fabula narrator. I speak about England, but my dear, I am talking about you, Germany. So I think that developing countries are telling something about us in reality. Thank you very much, Mario. It was worth the wait, I think, uh, <laughs> to hear your points and your experience from countries where I think what you mentioned about the crisis and the breaking of social contract is now even further um, reinforced by what is happening. Before I, I ask Todoris to comment and ask questions, there's one point I want to bring up because we received an email by one of the attendees. Uh, that's actually um, somebody from the United States who is also writing something that we should factor in the way that people um, need to see themselves as, as citizens. And what our friend is writing, she says that she's a citizen of the United States of America and in her words, she is appalled by the federal government, uh, and that would be an understatement. And the point she makes is that although the mayor in the city where she lives is taking very strong steps in trying to, pro to promote containment, uh, to make people understand that they should be wearing masks and everything, she feels a little bit powerless because in that case, the citizens want to do more than the government does. So we have also the inverse some, in some cases. I just wanted to add this into the discussion uh, not specifically for the United States. I mean, we're not judging anybody here. It's just an open discussion. But I think it was a very interesting question to, to uh, take into account as well. So, Dori, would you like to come into the discussion with your comments and questions, please? Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I listened to these remarks with great interest. And I kept thinking about one major, one specific issue that underlines everything that was said. And I would like to raise this at this point and get everyone's feedback on it. I think there's an existential question concerning civil society organizations around the world. There are some major challenges facing civil society's role in the new landscape that is shaping up uh, throughout this, through this crisis. 
according to a Harvard study that was published yesterday. Without a vaccine, social distancing measures must remain in effect around the world until I think as, as late as 2022. So economic activity is not going back to normal for the foreseeable future. Uh, rich countries are going to be fine eventually, but some countries are going to have serious debt issues. Some economies are going to be impacted in the long term. Rising unemployment is going to stretch social cohesion, even in re some rich countries. There are, there are going to be uh, severe humanitarian crisis in the developing world. And there is an unbelievable burden in mental health that is impossible to predict. Its consequence, consequences are impossible to predict. Now, these challenges seem tailor-made for civil society. I mean, civil society is meant to deal with issues like this. And, and yet, the magnitude of this crisis has sort of exposed the limitation the limitations of uh, civil society. Um, the message that I'm getting, that I'm receiving from this first full month of the crisis is that only sovereign, sovereign states or uh, cities or um, federal or local governments can handle problems of this size. That's the main message that we have been getting. It's like um, reality is telling civil society that it's fine for tackling problems in good times, in stable times, but when the going gets really tough, governments need to step in. That's uh, the main uh, message that I'm getting from the crisis so far in regards with the role of civil society. And what I, was, I would like to get from our panelists is some feedback on that. Do they agree that uh, civil society's role may be limited at this stage of the crisis. Uh, thank you very much, Todori. I will ask the uh, participants, the uh, panelists, to come to your question, although I would like also to add one or two points more that could be taken along so they can go for one round of, uh, of points that they want to make as a second, second round of interventions. Um, we also received some questions from um, a group of, of students from um, the United Kingdom uh, from the University of Nottingham and they mentioned one point that I consider very important that they say that what they saw in the case of response to the coronavirus is that civil society in the sense for example of uh, new entrepreneurship and hackathons and so on have been very efficient in some cases to provide technological solutions, to collect material, to channel material, which is not very different from what we heard from Christos Elefandis about what Sheria is doing for the least favored people in, in, uh, in society. So um, along with the question that you put, Thodori, that we see a lot of silencing, if you like, of the civil society, how can we maybe uh, try to reinforce the role of civil society in a proper way? Huh? Because we have seen in some cases also NGOs and so on being involved in uh, tackling the problem of migration in not the most exemplary, exemplary way, uh, if I can say, in the terms of how funds were used and so on. So um, with these questions just building up, I would like to ask uh, any of you to take the floor in the order that you like. So whoever wants to go first, just raise your hand. And the floor is yours, Andrea. Um, Mario, let's let's start with you, Mario. Thank you very much. Well, let me make three points to answer those questions. The first is that yes, these crises show a very interesting geographical dimension. In one end, is obviously global, and I am very preoccupied for the action that has been announced politically concerning the multilateral organization in charge of dealing with that. Uh, because uh, the spread, the, uh, the, the speed through which it went around shows that it's a global crisis. And we need a, a global system of investment in health to deal with it. But on the other hand, all the data show that these crises have a very strong local dimension. And in my country, for example, you saw two different uh, reactions, one much more affected than the other, by the local authorities in this crisis which had an immediate impact on the amount of infected and the death. So what does it mean? It means that the local dimension in all this story is extremely important. 
South of Italy has much less cases than Lombardy that has the best system of social health that existed supposedly before the crisis. So there is a matter of what the local authorities have done in this case. My second point is that this crisis shows once more that the problems we are dealing with are not sectoral, are multidimensional. Uh, uh, the person that raised the question clarified we will be confronted with social, psychological, economic problem, but we don't have the habit to answer to this dimension. We tend to focus on limited economic solution that we have experimented maybe in the past, even if this crisis is different in nature. So my point is, how do we build multidimensional answer? And here come again the importance of the local. In cities, why the mayor are so active? because they cannot just cut as a sausage their intervention. They have to address the problem where they are with the different tools that are required. Last but not least, in order to take too much of, of the time, you said how this can be done. How can we involve the local authorities or the local actors or the NGOs? I totally agree on the fact that we see an explosion of spontaneous initiatives that allow us to eat every day I have received food from farmers that brought to my house today. As we are seeing those things, how can we capitalize on this knowledge and entrepreneurship? I think we need, obviously, the public authorities, but we need a strong voice for the NGOs. So we need to invent instruments that are not episodic, not just, ah, look how fine it is, we put in a website, and everybody will be happy, or generalizing on the case of two or three examples what is going on. We need serious mechanism through which the local authority first, but also more and more, also national authorities, and including the system of aid and international cooperation, include the voice of this actor. That's why I was recalling the national plan. Let me just give an example very far from here, and I conclude. In France, after 68, the country was blocked. The president took an helicopter to go to Germany, and nobody knew what was going to happen. And at the end of the story, what was the answer? Something that is called Les Accords de Grenelle. For a series of days, different actors were sitting together, unions, entrepreneurs, government, local authorities, and many others, to discuss what France should have to do. I think this type of mechanism with a strong engagement of local authorities, because they are stronger than in the 68 and NGOs as well, with this type of mechanism, we can capitalize on all this energy. If not, if we continue to centralize, we will have delegitimized national authorities, very weak multilateral authorities that are weakened even further, and therefore strong tension that can end either like it was in the past in Latin America in uh, coup d'etat or in upheaval in the street. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, then I think I will uh, be giving the floor to Andrea who has asked for the floor, but I just wanted to make one point in what you mentioned, uh, the Les Accords de Grenelle, the, the discussions that happened after uh, May 68. It was very interesting to see that in France, this was a system that was revived at some point a uh, couple of years, two, three years ago, if I remember, on discussions specifically about the environment, which was the precursor that led to the leading role that, that France took about climate change, and they managed to have the Paris Accord. So it is a very, very pertinent example that you gave, and thank you very much, uh, because we were getting a lot of questions of asking us, okay, this is great, we need to find ways to involve the, the, the voices of civil society, but really, how can we do it? And I think that's a very good example and all the points that you mentioned. So, Andrea, please take the floor. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment a little bit on, uh, on, the, on the questions that you, that you made and also um, to Doris. The, the, um, the, the issue of um, whether this is a time for civil society or maybe it's not a time for civil society. I mean, that, um, the, the fact that when things become really uh, urgent, then government takes over in a top-down way. Uh, I think we are seeing this uh, in the uh, 
as a, it really as a, as a short term thing that happens when there is a decision to take that is a uh, maybe facing an emergency. But already at the moment in which we are in many, many countries in Europe, uh, and as we are deciding whether to continue in those restrictive measures and how to resume uh, social and economic activity, the, uh, the role of civil society has already become uh, essential and prominent and, uh, and underrated in the current political debate. Uh, that is very, very important. And it seems also from, from the comments that you were making, uh, uh, the, the thought that I had is that this problem is so global, uh, big and dense, it's so big that only small and local governments can solve it. Meaning, and, and the type, the peculiar aspects of this crisis are such, uh, and including the, the slowdown and this actually the stopping of the, of the traveling and the, and the physical presence in other places and the physical meeting, and that uh, the, really the focus is not on globalization in of itself, but really on the local dimension, on how we live together, on how we organize on the territory, on how we leave no one behind and the territory, and this is a, a sentence that we've heard. I'm sure uh, that uh, both my co-panelists have heard it several times because it's in it's in uh, the, the directly first-hand experience uh, of what they do in their different settings. Meaning, the idea that sustainable development and, and prosperity more generally should lead to a situation where no one is left behind is now put to the test, and uh, and the in the strongest possible way. We need to make sure that uh, if we want to deploy technological measures, the non-tech savvy are not left behind. If we want to empower citizens, the non-citizens are not left behind. If we want to uh, protect workers, the ones that are outside of the workforce are not left behind. And this is something that uh, really puts to the test our ability to do this and, and the core, uh, calls for a choral, for a collective effort to listen to each and every voice that we have in society. It is also a very important way to reflect on what we have been preaching in economic terms, in particular over the past years. And this, well, for a largely Greek audience, to me, is... Um, is a, is, a, is a highly deserving topic to, uh, to deal with. Meaning the idea that the focus on uh, fiscal discipline uh, over the years and also the focus on, if you wish, uh, specific approaches in economics, very neoclassical or Chicago approaches in economics, have led many governments to end up uh, uh, practicing um, economic policy in a way that is uh, uh, then leads to uh, cutting costs and looking for efficiencies in in healthcare, and thereby maybe depriving healthcare of the capacity needed to face an emergency. The fact that uh, uh, the economy and, and finance have become so short termist that governments have not worked on something that they knew would be coming at some point uh, the pandemic, so unpreparedness for the pandemic. All this leads us to reflect at the more macro level. As to what do we call progress and um, uh, do we call progress GDP do we call progress uh, re reduction of costs to reduction of taxes or do we call progress for example universal access to healthcare and universal I mean universal looking at Christos uh, universal means that really leaving no one behind so uh, in, in doing this I, I agree that civil society has been quite active in some cases but these are more the hackathons and the data paloozas I mean these are uh, this is great to see there's also the big movement to create this contact tracing app app is uh, is very highly deserving but um, the people that, are, that, are, that suffer from the digital divide, the people that don't have a smartphone uh, in the first place, uh, are not part of this story. And the people that are not uh, uh, digitally included or, or very digitally savvy are not going to participate in the same way. So it is actually the role of government to be the orchestrator of all the voices in, in civil society on top of the ones, and that's a fantastic news, that are really, really taking action by themselves. So what do we need? I think there are a number of methods that we can use to strengthen public engagement. And uh, the policies that we need now are really policies that will have to look and, and ga gather from people their experience or their projections on how they see themselves living in future scenarios in daily life and whether this is something that could be co-designed with them. Is this, uh, you know, the, the very simple things that we need today. Are we going to wear masks? Are we going to take turns? Are we going to send kids to school? And, and how are we going to do this in a way that doesn't create tensions on the system? And, um, it, it's, it's extremely important to preserve the ability for and, and, and actually nurture the ability of government to, to um, engage with these new forms of public engagement. And there's, technology can help us there, of course, even reaching out to the non-geeks, let's say, because technology can be made simple. 
and uh, the, the, the penetration of smartphones is, uh, is uh, very high. The, the ability to use basic functions in a phone is uh, fortunately very high today, is, uh, is something that even the elder, elderly could be involved into. It could use different means of communication. And this is something that would unleash uh, the forces that we've seen uh, in some parts of the world, including civil resistance in the United States that I've seen myself through friends and, uh, and colleagues, seeing when civil society really um, sort of overrules the federal government because it perceives that what is being done at the central level is completely unfit for purpose. Maybe we're gonna, if, if the EU level will not take adequate action in this respect, we might see a, sim a, a similar, a similar um, reaction on the side of European citizens. Whereas here, indeed, if the EU would manage um, to, to, uh, to really deploy those tools in the best possible way, um, I think the EU would actually be able to bridge uh, even the national level and reach out directly to the local level, something that the EU has, dream, has dreamt for, for a long time of doing and never managed to. And that's the opportunity. The opportunity is to leverage the good side, not the bad side of technology, and do this to uh, really engage with people uh, and gathering from people not what should be done for the WHO, what should be done in their daily lives to solve their daily problems the moment we decide that the time is ripe to go again outside. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. I think that uh, you will be getting yourself invited to a subsequent of, of, of our webinars because you now put the question of what the European Union would do, but it will be a point of whether the European Union will eventually manage to take a collective decision to do the things that it could be the leader on, but not today. We're not discussing this today because we need another few hours for this. I would like to ask Christos to comment on the questions and the points that you raised, and then we'll go for a, a, a wrapping up uh, round from Fodoris with final remarks and points, because we promised everyone this will be a webinar of 45 minutes. I am allowing, allowing an extra 10 minutes because we had the glitches in the beginning, so we started a bit late, but we'll need to wrap up because our viewers were promised that we'll be done within the 45 minutes. So, Chris, would you like to uh, take the floor? Yes, I, uh, I've been listening very carefully, and I think, I think what's important to, as far as we are concerned, to what we say is it's not it's not the government uh, against the civic society yeah it's not you know it's not us against them it's very very important i mean people ask me what's your vision about uh, uh, Shredia street paper and i always say that my vision about Shredia street paper is for for, for Shredia at some point in the future to stop to, to, to cease its uh, operations that there's no need for there's no need for Shredia to be to be around so what we have been seeing over the past few weeks in Greece at least, uh, and not only because I talk with, uh, with a number of colleagues from around the world, whether that's Denmark or Sweden or the United States, is that the civic society, grassroots organizations, are really mobilizing and you know, to, to try as much as they can to, to support people, support themselves who are socially excluded. Okay, so this, this is, and as I said in, in my introduction, this is what we experience here in Athens as well. Because uh, as I said, may, there are many, many uh, organizations and state at state and local government level that have scaled down or they have uh, suspended their operations altogether. Okay. And we, we, we are trying as, as much as we can to make up for this, for this vacuum, for this for this loss, for this gap. So, and the, we will keep keep trying to to be to be as supportive as we can. And um, and of course, I have to 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 mention this that we have of course ourselves to to adjust to the new reality. And we have been asking now our vendors to adjust too. You know, if they, if they need to learn, for example, this is a very very important how to use cashless payments when they have never ever had a, a held a, a credit card in their hands in their whole life this is what has to happen and i'm quite confident that people you know would be adjusting as well thank you very much christo and now Thodori. um i've been looking at some interesting questions as well but since we don't have a lot of time 
to address them. Uh, my final bullet points from this very fruitful discussion is that, of course, civil society still has an important role to play. Uh, I think one of the speakers mentioned that this is a global problem that will be solved mostly locally. Many things will change, are indeed changing. Priorities will change for civil society as it does for uh, governments. Funding will change. Sources of funding will be different. Uh, trillions are going to be spent to uh, face this crisis. Some of these funds are go going to be channeled through civil society and the way that it will be spent and utilized is something extremely important. Technology is going to play a significant part uh, in this evolving, um, uh, in this evolving, evolving landscape. So I think that this is a very, uh, I wouldn't use the, the term exciting because it sounds too positive and our, uh, what is going on is not positive at all, but it's uh, a landscape that is shifting, that is changing uh, rapidly. And we are, uh, as a non-profit organization, very interesting to see what you, our speakers individually, will be doing in the future. We're looking closely at what Shedia is doing here locally. And we'll uh, also be monitoring best practices around the world. That's going to be something that's going to be very interesting to uh, hear about and to communicate. We are just in the first month of this uh, global crisis since it broke out and came to Europe and came to the, to, to the West. There are many new episodes to see. And uh, this discussion has been a great start. And I think that our uh, participants and our, uh, our panelists and our followers and our listeners uh, have a lot to think about on these issues. Uh, from this afternoon on. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to listen to, the, to these views and I hope that everyone had a wonderful discussion. Back thank to you, you very much, Sodori. It's, it's a great pleasure to be sharing this experience with you and with the support of the analysis. Uh, and of course, the joining of forces between EPLO and the analysis, I think we, we get off to a very good start together in this. Um, it's true what you said that we have been having a lot of questions. Let me just refer to one or two in terms of titles. We heard from some people saying that uh, as there will be um, more and more difficulties for, the, for, for actually supporting development, what could be the role for NGOs also in terms of how they can support their existing priorities like climate change and so on because there will be a very big shift. We also heard from some of the um, attendees about the issue of how the cultural part has to be included in all this and how the uh, civil society in terms of supporting culture can be important because there will be a very strong human, psychological and cultural issue that needs to be involved. And uh, I. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to delve on this, but I promise all of, of you and our attendees that we will be noting uh, the questions and follow up on them with further webinars. I want to thank all of you because I think we touched on very important things. We touched on the issues of challenges that will be even more increased than what they were before and the need to include social, civil society and social partners in addressing them so that we do not start off the wrong way, as Andrea said in the beginning. We heard from Mario in the cases of where the social contract is already shredded or it has a problem that things will become even worse and more difficult actually, like examples he mentioned from Latin America, from Africa and so on. And then we heard from the side of the people that work actually on the field uh, from Shadia, from Christos Elefantis, about how important, but also how difficult it is to stay on the front line and do these things. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, also hearing specific examples, like what uh, Mario said about the example of the Grenelle and other uh, forms of putting the structural and, and proper governance things that need to take place. And what I want to tell all of you is that uh, with the help and collaboration of the analysis we have in mind to take you know the um the key points of all this and turn it into a one or two page report that will be emerging from this report so that something stays behind something that can be used by governors by uh decision makers and also by ngos so that we can reach out to the next steps 
With that said, I want first of all to thank all of you. I wish we were in a room so you would be hearing the applause of about 200 people that have been following what we're discussing over Zoom and uh, also over YouTube because we had a live transmission on, on Zoom as well, on YouTube as well. Um, so thank all of you, uh, all three of you as panelists and Thodori very much you as well for your participation. I also want you to put in your um, calendars the date of Thursday, 30th of April. This is not next Thursday, it's Thursday after. Uh, again, at five o'clock in the afternoon, Athens time, four o'clock Central European time, where we'll have the second webinar, again, uh, in collaboration with the Aneosis, where we will be speaking specifically about the economic recovery and the need to match it to sustainability um, instead of actually following away as far as we can from sustainability with other speakers. And with that, thank you all very much. Thank you to our attendees and our viewers very much. And see you in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Take care.